Okay, everybody, I've got Adrian Times here. Um, Adrian's been an active member of the Extropian community, often posting on the Extropian mailing list for quite some uh, number of years now. Now, um, Adrian, would you like to give a brief introduction to who you are, what you like doing, and, and um, some of your creative endeavors? Sure. So, Jack of all trades, master of some. Uh, my day job is uh, web and mobile programming, but I dabble in all kinds of things. Uh, nanotech, rocketry, robotics, and so on. They're hobbies until I can pay them pay the bills, but I dabble in them, I learn, I investigate stuff that I'm curious in. I even write a little science fiction here and there, some of it paid, technically. Most of it's more been, most of the time science fiction facts have been more believable than reality. <laughs> Great. <laughs> I'd like to live in science fiction more believable than reality. Uh, you're sounds... crackling up a little bit. Okay. Is that better? That's better. That's better. Okay. Cool. <laughs> All right. So um, let's uh, fire on into the interview then. So, um, yeah, well, you spoke about masters of science and, and computer science. Where did you do that? Uh, UC Santa Barbara and UC Los Angeles, uh, University of California. Right. Okay. Uh, bachelor's at Santa Barbara, master's Los Angeles. Okay, so did you do sci Masters of Science first, or did you like to do the... No, no, a Bachelor's of yeah. Science always yeah. comes first. Okay, sorry, yeah, I, I missed that. Yep, cool. Uh, so what got you interested in science and, and computer science? Well, computer science first. Uh, my parents, first and foremost. Uh, my dad, uh, not many people have heard of TimeNet, but it was like a two-step predecessor to the Internet, and it was mostly my dad's invention. I was brought mm. up on his knee. I was programming before I was 10. Right. So, yeah, by the time I got into high school, there was no question I was going into programming for <laughs> my, at least my first career. Nice. So this was even um, earlier than the well. Yeah, yeah, much earlier. Yeah, wow, that's interesting. <laughs> Winged Cat Solutions. Do you want to talk briefly about what that is? Your... Um, it's my own company. It does whatever heck I want it to. It, my, my, it, it's technically an outsourced research and design laboratory, it is a company front under which I can do whatever projects I want to. Um, and I have done many different uh, projects. Mm -hmm. um, some tech writing, some, again, some robotics, nanotech, and so on and so forth. Wow. Um, Sounds great. You, you've been a pioneer in a lot of these uh, interesting ideas that uh, I guess a lot of this, including me, um, have really just cottoned on to in, you know, in the 90s or 2000s. It's uh, quite interesting to talk to somebody who's been sort of uh, immersed in, in lots of interesting things. So let's let's move on to what sort of style of philosophy. I, I, I'm not sure if you actually ascribe to any particular one, if you don't go with the brand name philosophies like we, we, we discussed. Well, yeah, like, like I mentioned before the interview, um, Following a name brand philosophy and following it for the rules usually traps you in the in trying to follow that philosophy or what you, other people claim to be that philosophy rather than doing what you believe to be the right thing. And there is some justification for that, especially if, if for entities that don't have any sense of what the right thing is, like businesses, governments, and so on. Um, but for people, people have a moral sense. Uh, so trying to just follow the rules means you're just following the rules. Um, part of the problem with this is strict interpretations of laws where they were never intended to apply and don't have back to apply on review. Um, the infamous just following orders excuse. I mean, yeah, that's a World War II callback, but it applies. Uh, biblical liberalism or similar problems with all kinds of uh, other philosophies. I mean, see the problems that Muslims are having these days with um, Islamic radicalists who say so and so is forbidden, is forbidden or is mandated by the Quran, and actually you look at it and it doesn't say that, but they say it does, and they're willing to kill for it because they think it, they have been convinced that that's what it means. And if you surrender your moral sense to what other people will claim a certain set of rules is, well, then yeah. Um, it, so, it certainly sounds like you're you're not really in favor of deontological approaches to to uh, philosophy. Uh, yeah, I think that would be a fair statement. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I guess like it's useful to have descriptions or um, labels, though, because it helps people uh, communicate about um, these types of philosophies without really uh, espousing 
you know, like a, a paper in discussion and agreeing to like uh, terms on the spot. Um, do, would you consider it? What do you think of utilitarianism, for instance? Um, again, I haven't put too much thought into specific name brands of philosophies. Yeah. Um, the closest one I, I do hear towards is more consequentialism, or at least yeah. doing what you believe based on the evidence will lead to the good best results. Sure. Yeah, yeah. That, um, that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean you always win. That just means mm-hmm. you do what you think is going to win, and you do your best to, uh, towards that. Mm-hmm. It also means if you find evidence suggesting that what you thought is the case is not the case, then you back up and uh, correct based on the new evidence. Hmm. Sure, and that uh, that sounds very much like the scientific method. <laughs> um, there are very many aspects of it in there. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, look, it, it it's interesting to me because uh, I've heard claim that a lot of th- some of the earlier extropian um, ideas about uh, transhumanism were influenced by virtue ethics. Um, that being I- improving one's characteristics in order to achieve higher aims, right? So it's about like improving characteristics rather than um, ascribing value to the ends of um, acts. That's certainly a means to an end. Um, bettering yourself, bettering your position so that you can achieve something is certainly a good thing to do, but not as an end goal in and of itself. Um, for instance, the old saying, money is the root of all evil. Uh, there are people, I know some people, who treat money as the ultimate scorecard of life. It isn't. Um, yes, you need lots of money to do great things, but you get the money in order to do the great things. You don't get the money just to get the money. Mm-hmm. If all you got was a bunch of money, then, okay, you're a rich guy, so what? If you get rich and then use it to change the world somehow, you've just changed the world. And, yeah, sometimes it takes billions of dollars. Oftentimes it only takes millions or less. And further, if you actually are starting to change the world, you can sometimes find that getting the rest of the money you need, once you have proof that you have started on this path, becomes a lot easier. Yeah. Um, I mean, see the whole SOS behind Kickstarter and uh, similar startups these days. Yeah. Yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, like, <laughs> if, if, if money wasn't the exchange mechanism for utility, then what would it be? Um, I can't really answer that question. But Yeah. It, it, maybe it's some like it's some future time we'll be able to exchange things by you know pure utility rather than um so, you know maybe it'll be an advanced form of money. Who knows? Yeah, there'll probably be some kind of proxy to measure the utility of things, and as now it will probably be less than perfect. It may be slightly better than what we have now, hope so. but there will still be flaws in the system. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, let's talk about the extropian movement and, uh, and especially transhumanism. Um, so, look, a lot, a lot of the extropian, uh, the extropians laid a lot of groundwork to what um, often people to refer to as transhumanism today. So, w- would you like to describe some of the earlier um, incantations of the extropianism, like, um, and how how that resonates with you and and how you think that that influenced transhumanism? Uh, so, over the past couple of decades, the Serpians were one of the forerunners of transhumanist thinking. Um, that's slacked off of late, not so much because the Serpians have dwindled, but because what they were fighting for has increasingly become mainstream. They have won. And, okay, so yeah. what new battles? There are some, Others have taken up those uh, those banners. Um, the Atropians now are more of a conversation for the remaining bits of their vision that are becoming mainstream uh, and picking up a few new uh, battles. Um, but mostly it's discussing and how to implement these things. Right. As opposed to, like, media and revolutionizing where you see things like uh, democratic transhumanism, the IWT, yep. um, where you got blog posts and... Uh, media pressure and events and it, 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 this coming uh, not this weekend it is one I think next weekend well but yeah it is going to be a, uh, a conference at which uh, Max Moore and Natasha and you know, the Europeans are going to be yeah I'm aware of that that's uh, transhuman kind of vision bag there yeah, yeah that's correct yeah yeah 
So, so um, the extropian movement now, I mean, it's like a lot of it's on the mailing list, which I subscribe to, and I, I try to read some of the posts. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of the guys, they're really super brainy. They, they have a lot of, like, a background in physics and background in um, political theory and, and science. And I, I, I would, I'm not sure. They, they all seem to be pretty literate with IT. So, yeah, like, it's very impressive, that mailing list for sure. But um, in terms of political ideologies, uh, the extropian movement um, seemed to begin with uh, libertarianism, and was, mm -hmm. most people on the extropian mailing list seem to subscribe to that theory. I don't know if that's an accurate assumption. To some extent of it, varying degrees based on the member, but yeah, I, I think that's an accurate statement. Mm. Uh, certainly more so than a uh, mainstream public. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think like some of the the, the extropian um, facts originally were very libertarian. Um, some people have said that uh, it was very influenced by Ayn Rand. Would you agree with that? There's certainly been a lot of influence. Yeah, it's not uh, the sole influence by any means, but uh, certainly there has been quite a bit of thought from that. Right. Would you agree with um, Ayn Rand's uh, visions of? Um, you know, like a what I agreed is good. Do you agree with that? To some extent, yes. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, greed, greed is a good motivator. Um, wanting to achieve more is good. On the other hand, uh, there are interpretations of greed which say, okay, and take out everyone else, which is not what she meant, but it's still a, a, an interpretation a lot of people will get. Sure. Um, and that's not okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, and actually, that that's, that's one of the main problems is misreading Ayn Rand. You say you support Ayn Rand, and someone else takes it in a completely different say, uh, way, and they hear you say you support Ayn Rand, so you think you support them, when in fact you do not. Mm -hmm. um, see the earlier question about subscribing to name brand philosophies. Well, Ayn Rand is a name brand. <laughs> she she, 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 she is. <laughs> Yeah. One of the more recognizable name brands in philosophy these days. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. So, um, well, in terms of what can be achieved and, and how to achieve it, like it seems like, you know, like a capitalism for me sounds like a, uh, well, is, has proven to be a very, very useful conduit for achieving things and getting stuff done. Um, and but you know socialism can to some extent can be argued for the same thing, uh, but some people value socialism more than capitalism, and others value capitalism more than socialism. Sometimes exclusively, you know what I mean? Like capitalism yeah. is bad, socialism is good. Socialism is bad, capitalism yeah, is good. Yeah, that's that's something I try to veer away from and get the good points of both. Right. Um, the process of accumulating wealth and doing the things necessary to accumulate the wealth. That is good. Um, however, just sitting on the wealth and keeping the wealth out of the market, that is bad. Um, and these days you hear about the 1%, a lot of what they're doing, and they'll argue against this, but it, you look at it and they are, keeping the wealth to themselves, keeping it out of the uh, common pool. Mm -hmm. um, and to that point, they are, uh, this is to, as far as they're doing that, they are in effect removing wealth from what ev the sum of everyone has. Right. Like yeah. they're sitting on this. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I think there was uh, an article. I'm going to um, bring it up somewhere so I can actually remember the name of it. It was about um, you know the uh, 35 percent or something. Top 35 percent of people. There we are. In, at Oxfam, 85. The 85 richest people are as wealthy as the poorest half in the world. Um, I didn't actually uh, follow on to to read deeply into this article, but uh, yeah, it, it, uh, do you think the these eighty five people can do more f for the world, increase utility for everybody in in that would be more useful or um, more efficient than re redistributing the wealth to the um, the poorest half of the world? Um. Actually, I'm going to have to say yes. So this may seem weird given my earlier answers, but I'll explain why. Yep. Um, you have to consider the bottom half of the world. Mm. Poor, not educated, not well motivated to do stuff. Now, this could be changed with sufficient resources, right. but um, 
just snap removing Wells from the top 85 and giving these four BC guys money, that's not going to cause, that's not going to solve the problem. What you need to do is you need to educate these people, need to motivate them, need to get them, get them brought up. Um, that takes time as well as money. Um, and frankly, it doesn't take nearly a, that much money as the top 85 have in total. I mean, so, sure, you could just immediately redistribute the wealth. That gets you a short-term solution. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, they, like, you, you hear these uh, foundations which say education is the key to changing the world, and they're correct. Mm -hmm. Bill Gates, for instance. Yeah. Mm. Well, he's a very and, interesting yeah, example. Bill Gates is one of the richest people, but he isn't as rich as all 85 top uh, billionaires in the world. No. He is just one of them. Yes, that's correct. He's one of the people who's convinced other billionaires to give away half of their money, <laughs> right? Right, but that's still less than all of this yes. wealth altogether, hmm. and he's making a lot of change just with the part that he has. So, yeah. Well, if we can if we can persuade the top eighty five percent of the world to uh, um, utilize the money that will ultimately uh, on, on projects that will ultimately increase redistrib redistributable utility. Um, then I think that that it is worth funneling ma money into large projects, and if these large, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. And if these like, like I'll just be repeating myself, really. If that if these large projects do achieve the aims of having uh, increasing the amount of utility that can be redistributed amongst everybody who wants it, <laughs> um, then yeah, I, I think yeah. that that's a worthy goal. It's possible, yeah. But um, ultimately, that has education. to happen. <laughs> yeah. Education's only one of the things. Um, if you take a look at, let, let's just take a simple example of food and curing uh, hunger in the world. Hmm. That's not just a, pr a problem of giving the poor people food. Uh, the main problem is actually distribution networks. Hmm. Um, you try to give the poor people food, guess what? A lot of it gets stolen by bandits or redistributed by governments or some other ways in which it doesn't actually go to the people you want to give it to. Mm -hmm. Instead, it gets sold off to line the pockets of the people with guns in the area. Mm -hmm. If you got rid of the people with guns in the area, or at least had them govern at nearly as responsibly as any Western country you want to pick, that would, that would eliminate hunger, or at least what we currently define as hunger in the world, almost overnight. Mm -hmm. But that would be that would quite uh, require quite a lot of acrobatics in um, re refining people's uh, people's desires, what they want. You know, I mean, yeah. we're all greedy. I mean, that's a thing. Anybody who's yeah, like, it, it, yeah, there's greed. Then there's the sub form of greed called corruption, which you need to take down. Um, and then there are a bunch of other market inefficiencies. But if you got that, you could cure hunger without actually redistributing any food. Or at least not redistributing any food yourself. Hmm. Yeah, that, that seems like a pretty difficult challenge. <laughs> to, um... It is. It is, and the first challenge is just to get most people to recognize what the problem is. Yeah. It isn't actually giving the people food. It's making them able to keep their own food and grow their own food without having it stolen away from them. Mm -hmm. Um, in in terms of like trying to educate people that this is a a good way forward, I mean, it's I, I, sometimes education doesn't actually change people's um, desires or intentions or how they uh, reinforce their ego. For instance, Self, people who are rich often want to be more rich. You know, people who who, who are well off want to be more well off. It seems like this big status game between like alpha male dominance goes back to you know the African savanna. If your neighbor's got something, you want it, but you want mm -hmm. something better. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. My take on that is one of the safest and surest ways to do that is to make the something better and make it so that most people can get at it. Not necessarily everyone, um, because that runs into extremes, and some people don't want it. But, uh, for example, life extension, um, live to be 200. If you, can, if you had it so that one person could live to be 200, that's one thing. If you got it so that the average person or at least the average person in Western countries could live to be 200, that gets a lot more support and is possibly easier than having just one person live to 200. Yeah, well, you have a lot more test cases. <laughs> yeah, a lot more test cases, a lot more people contributing uh, their own knowledge and resources. Yeah. 
um, and a lot less people being jealous and wanting to take out that one person who's demanding he lived to 100, 200 and nobody else lived to 200. Mm. And there's another interesting side benefit for peop- uh, having people live for a lot longer, and that is... Um, I guess maybe a, a bias towards longer term thinking since people are going to be around for for longer than like 70 or 60 years or 80 years people yep. might be uh, more interested in what might happen after this century <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah and also the resources that went into train that person uh, or retraining yeah. if their industry goes obsolete but they learn a new career at 100 mm. um, well, guess what? If, if if working if retirement is now one seventy instead of seventy, mm. then if you are a sixty or seventy or eighty year old person whose industry goes away, mm. guess what? It's a lot more viable to learn a new industry because you can expect to have a full, a, a profitable, a productive career in it. Mm. Whereas currently, a lot of people, it just it wasn't the U.S. A lot of people who are dropping out of the job market. They are discouraged because their industry went away. They can't find a new job, and they think that the amount of effort it would take to learn the jobs that are in demand is not justified by the amount of productive time they think they have left. Mm. That is a problem. Mm. Um, and I will narrow, further narrow that down just to say computer science, programming. Um, I believe there is little question that there are lots and lots and lots of programming jobs out there. Some of them they don't pay that well, but certainly most of them, even the cheap outsourced ones, tend to pay better than the minimum wage of food service in good jobs. But I, mean, I may single out food service unfairly. It is a stereotype, but there are other. Basically, even the even the cheapest programming jobs tend to pay more than minimum wage. Put it that way. Mm-hmm. Whatever minimum wage is. Uh, and yeah, I talk to people who uh, have dropped out of the labor force. I try to sell them this, and they think, oh, programming, computer science, mathematics, it's so hard to learn. It isn't. <laughs> it isn't. I have taught people at least the basics of computer yeah, science. Yeah. Um, I don't think, I have, think you I, need I, mathematics I have for computer many science. People I've done, and it's like, okay, I, I give them like a couple hours of uh, coaching through, and then I show them how to get the examples online. There are so many fully automated self-service learning facilities for this kind of thing mm. on the web. Automation. For free. Mm. You just need to know, A, that they're out there, mm. and B, how to find them. And, and A is actually the biggest thing. Yeah. Look, yeah, I'm there, with there, you there. So <laughs> actually, if I may go on on that, the, um, for a lot of things, it's not so much finding the information, it is knowing that the information can be found, that it exists, and having some clue about the keywords to use to find it. The rest is just tapping into Google, Yahoo, or whatever, and browsing the results. Wikipedia sometimes. Hmm. And sure, that may not make you an expert in it, but it at least gives you the basics so you can evaluate and see, is this something you wish to pursue? Hmm. And if it is, often you'll get pointers to how to pursue and how to get uh, more information. Yeah. Interesting. That, you, that, you, yeah. Yeah, that, that is the practice I follow to learn about nanotechnology, robotics, quantum science, yada, yada, yada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, here's the thing. I mean, like, uh, you brought up automation, um, and this is a concern for a lot of people, uh, seeing that automation is happening, like, uh, in many areas compared to uh, what, what it was happening. Like, computation has allowed um, automation to happen in, in more intellectual areas than uh, there were before computation. Um, and so there, that may um, saturate the market with automated automatons um, doing whatever they need to do without need have have need for employing um, the people you would normally employ without computation. So, what do you think? Is is there going to be a future where automation um, increases uh, uh, at the benefit of um, available jobs? Do you think there will always be available um, employment opportunities for people? Um, I believe there will be employment opportunities for some people, most depending on what people want to do and what exactly you would define as employment. Um, one future that has been posited is the leisure society 
where people need to work 10 hours a week, if that, mm -hmm. in order to get a living wage, and a living wage which would be substantially above what we consider a living wage today, mm -hmm. in terms of re real money, even after accounting for inflation. Mm -hmm. um, but even with that, there are still going to be things which no one, um, be it human or AI, because a lot of these things are enabled by having a true AI all over the place, but a lot of things which people haven't figured out how to do but well, so then there's a position for someone to figure out how to do that. Why, why wouldn't the AIs be able to do that? Uh, well, by that point, uh, the AI is being able to solve that. Um, you send that far enough and then the AIs become people or the people become AIs of the upload scenario. Well, maybe. <laughs> right, so what do you define as a person? Hmm. But yeah, there will be opportunities for people in whatever form Persons. to do yeah. this. <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah, not not necessarily just humans. Um, yeah. Well, here's the thing. I mean, like a uh, bio biology is often thought to be a bit of a bottleneck when it comes to uh, information processing. Mm -hmm. um, now, if AIs do get really amazing, and like you know, we, we, we're both everybody watching should be pretty familiar with the term singularity, um, or intelligence explosion, uh, occurs while it's accelerating returns and such. If AIs do actually get really, really efficient, um, and well, we could merge with them, as Kurzweil says, and, and, and this, that, and the other, we could upload, uh, but um, our architecture, our biological architecture, may still remain a bottleneck. Um, and, uh, you know, whether AIs will keep us around or not is a different question. Um, e even if they do keep us around, um, I can't see, if that in that scenario, I can't see any use for our utility, except for just sitting around and enjoying, enjoying uh, existing. <laughs> well, in that case, you have to define what is R and which subset you're talking about. Um, but what I'm saying, actually, even today, um, is a lot of cyberization is probably the best word for it that I've heard. Mm. Where Are you talking about Norbert, Norbert Weiner's cyborg idea? Yeah. Well, well let, let, let me define it. Uh, the automation that comes up and the intelligence enhancements that come up are in parallel to and enhancing those things that human beings cannot do well. Uh, for instance, memory aids, uh, rec facial recognition is uh, one thing that's been bandied about late lately. Yeah, 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 yeah. The, the salesman's app. You get a Google Glass, hmm. uh, which you're walking down the, the road, you see someone, and you, it's a potential sales target. The glass uh, goes to your database, goes to social media, looks the person up, and says, okay, here's the person's name, here's what he's into, here's things that you have that may be of interest to him. Mm. Now, of course, if the glass gets it wrong a lot, the salesman is not going to be trusting that app a lot, so that kind of filters out the spam problem. But if the glass gets it right, then all of a sudden you have this person plus glass, but the person's what the people care about, who has this amazing uh, pocket of, here, let me help you with this, let me help you with this, let me help you with this. Mm. Right, yeah, it does increase the, the um, potential for, for humans to be able to aid each other. Uh, yeah, yeah, for sure, in this big augmented reality uh, future that I'm looking forward to. Um, I, I've, I spoke with John Smart about his um, ideas of uh, personal or digital symbionts, or he doesn't call them, he just calls them digital assistants, where they just get smarter and smarter and they learn your values and your motives and, 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 and sort of can can find people who, who can help you, can help you itself, and all that sort of thing. So, interesting future, huh? <laughs> well, let me, let, me, uh, let me give you a personal a tidbit on that, I mean, mm. since this is video anyway. Yeah. Come on. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so this is just a standard Android wrist phone. Do you want to hide it? Hide on, it on a, a wrist mount. Yep. yep. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Can't see? see the face of it. Oh, yes? Oh, cool. Yep. Yeah. All right. Yeah, this is a standard wrist mount. Yeah. And it's just on a standard Velcro mount. Yeah. You cyborg. <laughs> yeah. You. Um, I, I wear that. It's basically a, a large wristwatch, which <laughs> yeah. happens to be my Android and all the other things. Mm. 
so I can uh, tap on it. Uh, GP GPS is hands-free, which is a thing in California, so long as I'm pulled over when I'm um, interfacing with it. But when I'm driving along, mm -hmm. it can just give me directions, and I glance at it as so long as I keep my eyes on the road most of the time. It's also mm -hmm. got uh, verbal instructions. Mm -hmm. um, and if I need to take a call, well, so long as, again, I'm pulled over or a stoplight when I'm tapping on it, but when the call goes long, I'm just there, and it is completely hands-free. Mm -hmm. And it does have a mode where I can give it voice instructions, too. It, I have, my, myself don't use it that much, but some people do. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. And it's These right things. there. If I'm in a conversation and there is a topic, <laughs> which can easily be looked up on the web, yeah, if, yeah. Uh, if anybody was at a computer or not. Mm. Well, I am at a computer. Mm. Exactly. Yeah. And everybody's got these things in their, in their pockets or whatnot. Were it just right. like a yeah, t 10 years ago? Not everybody had like um, you know the the ease of access to the internet. Where at twenty years ago, not everybody really, not a large percentage of people didn't even have the internet, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. it's quite amazing how fast we have sort of dived into this information culture, and it's uh, it's for me, I think it's a great thing. <laughs> yeah. It's a uh, it's kind of strange to be alive at this sort of transition time. Um, yeah, I, I, what I am interested in is some of the future applications that make it very easy to sort of monitor health and and personal sort of stats and be take a more proactive approach to uh, to um, one like monitoring one's uh, um, insulin levels, monitoring you know um, one's blood sort of um, alkali alkalinization, all that sort of thing. So this quantified self movement which has become quite popular globally but started in the the Silicon Valley again with uh, Kevin Kelly and, and others I mean like the, I'm not saying he actually came up with the original idea but it the movement seems to have sprung from a lot of these uh, forward-thinking communities in the in the Silicon Valley yeah so what do you think about quantified self and and uh, and such yeah I haven't done Meh. too much into that because I haven't yeah. had reason to. Mm. Well, you, how do you know? You, maybe you do. <laughs> I guess you uh, go. From, do you go to the doctors regularly? What I've seen it is mainly self measurements, and I haven't come across specific things which it would help me measure. Mm. It when I do, and there may will probably be some day when I do, I can look into it at that time. Sure. So yeah. then I got other things to do. I mean, I only have 24 hours in a day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a, that's the useful thing about um, this monitoring uh, culture. If we can monitor our internal states without having having to um, expend our clock cycles on it, then we won't need to spend any extra hours like typing in the data and collecting information and making sure it conforms to certain programs and this, that, and the other will well, be automated. Well, there's monitoring and there's the data gathering, but in what form does the data come? Mm -hmm. um, if you get it into an Excel spreadsheet and then you need to type it into some web form, yeah. or because of web form you can't copy and paste it or whatever, it's well, then guess what? You have just spent all that extra time typing it in. Mm. And further, if you do it because you think you have to and you're not actually getting that much value out of it, mm. You just got negative value out of it because you spent all this time <laughs> typing it in yeah. and you didn't get anything out of it. Yeah. Now, there are people who will experiment, and I'm perfectly fine with that. I, myself, mm. I invest my time where I see the need. Sure. Okay, well, um, yeah. Uh, it's interesting um, that, you know, we have these mobile applications. So are you worried about privacy implications? Uh, are, are you worried about little brothers and sisters watching you? Are you worried about the participatory panopticon? <laughs> the main worry about privacy that I have is data taken out of context. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and th that, that, that is actually a big thing. Is, is there any such thing uh, as a perfect context? It, that's why it's a worry. Um, the, if you have, say, a data that says, this person has walked so many miles per day, well, do you, are you looking at them for exercise, or are you looking at them for what? But if you don't have any re, any context as to why they're doing it, or what counts as walking, um, 
Well, someone who walks, or who say a dock worker, is going to be walking around a lot more than someone who's sitting at his desk all day. And if you don't have that context, then the conclusions you're trying to draw from that may be completely null and void. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, more seriously, um, you have invasion into the bedroom. People have to do all kinds of what things in the whatever. privacy of their bedrooms that are, unless, unless they live, rise to the level of abuse or some long-term damage, are completely the uh, business of the people who are in there and not the business of people outside. Hmm. Right. Here's an interesting scenario, um, and I, I don't know if it justifies uh, surveillance into people's bedrooms, but there... Um, Look, I can't give you references right now, but the, the, there was a woman who accused some dude of rape, um, and he was going to get like a prison sentence or get sort of sued or something like that, something pretty heavy. But there was a surveillance camera, which um, and he didn't know about it, she didn't know about it, but it was like a, it had that room um, in its view, and yeah, he was uh, he, he, he it was proven that he he wasn't actually. Um, committing any form of rape and so he got off and yeah she she didn't get any money and he didn't go to prison so you know there's some weird cases yeah like, like i said unless it constitutes it raises the level of abuse or some mm. or, yeah, or something right. where there are consequences outside the, the, uh, the bedroom yeah. and in a case of rape there most certainly is mm -hmm. yeah so so actually do you think we'll ever get to a stage where we learn not to care if anybody's watching um no. 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 I'm, I'm pretty sure we will not. Okay. Um, because there will always be things people want to do that other people would object to um, because because they don't have the context of nothing else. Mm. Yeah, and, and computing the context requires many clock cycles and people's ideologies get mixed up in the mess so <laughs> it's interesting all right well um actually i did have a couple of more questions on in this section now i should just uh notify that you, the viewers are going to be subject to three <laughs> this is but the first um and we were talking about the extropian movement uh and the democratic uh movement in transhumanism now what would you would you summarize okay um would you say that there is any good in the democratic um, movement for it, in transhumanism? Of course there is. Yes? How would you describe it? Um, it? Put it this way. Anything which is not a complete bastion of evil, and there are very, very, very few such things in real life, has some good in it. Mm -hmm. Now, what specific good? That requires analysis and looking into them, and I haven't looked too far into the, the Democratic Transhumanist mm -hmm. group. Okay, sure. Um, but as a blanket statement, is, is there any good in them? Of course there is. Sure, right. Okay. Um, so what what approaches... So, so, well, then, I might as well just ask, just for, for, for completeness, um, then what are the main benefits of um, an, the extro extropian uh, uh, view on transhumanism? As opposed to? As opposed to, yeah. well, the democratic. What's, how would you like Again, again I haven't looked too yeah. far into the democratic, so I can't make that comparison. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, then let's ask, what approaches um, can you, uh, can we take to further technological growth with high impact um, in view of commercialization, and uh, uh, commercialization, in fact, it itself is one of them. Uh, you see all kinds of things, um, or all kinds of ex technologies that get in the lab and never make it out of the lab. Um, I can't, I, I can't even give you a list of some of the ones I've seen just in the past week. Uh, some of them are actually confidential. Yeah. Um, but people come up, or just take a look at the science news for any given month. Right. You'll see all kinds of, this discovery could change the world. This good discovery could have this kind of thing. And yeah, it could if it ever got to the people who would actually use it. Right. And it never does. Why? Um, for commercialization itself. Yeah. is such a big challenge. That is, taking the technologies that could do good hmm. and finding ways to make them or use them in a way that costs less 
than the benefit that as far as measured by what people are willing to pay for. Sure. So it's, it, it seems pretty difficult and um, often people uh, don't realize how much money it takes to actually test drugs, for instance. Um, you know, get a drug onto market, it needs to go through FDA, okay, um, and there are laws about uh, trialing these drugs on people, whether they want to, whether they're willing to, to give their bodies up for this, um, or not. I think it's getting better. <laughs> but... It is, it, it is. There are actually, there are some very good reasons for these the laws. At the same time, there is much room to streamline the tests yeah. while still getting equally valid data. Mm. And this is only going to get more so with the uh, ascent of computational biology. Systems biology, yes. Big fan. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. In fact, I might be going to a little conference on this uh, in a couple of weeks, if I can afford it. Anyway, but yeah, um, I, I, that's one of the, another topic, which <laughs> there's so many topics I'm really a fan of. Nanotechnology is yeah. one we're going to be covering in the next section, but systems biology is... Is, uh, seems to me as though it's got a lot of headroom, and and I'm hopeful about it because they're, they're, it's been taken seriously, um, and this is one of the 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 key um, name brand research efforts that I, I believe that um, will uh, have a lot of um, a lot of influence on the outcomes of what the transhumanists are sort of. Uh, uh, thinking about like yeah, so how how do we actually um, achieve more <laughs> morphological freedom? For instance, to take an extreme example, well, we can't do that because we don't have the option um, to to yes. do a lot of the things that we want, right? We can't we can't grow wings, <laughs> we can't have Jupiter brains. Um, <laughs> yeah. A lot of these things will at least initially be, um, or maybe not Jupiter brains wings a lot of these things will be enabled by a, some so like a virtualization of biology and be able to study and work out ways to extend and and uh, um, the capabilities there and nanotechnology in the long run as well so um yeah I'm very excited about that and I guess you are too <laughs> yeah <laughs> and you were just about to say something and I rudely interrupted because I often get excited no no <laughs> <laughs> um, so well, yeah. Um, um, so, for instance, land landmines in um, patent systems, people patenting uh, technologies so that it can't be researched and developed uh, by someone else who is more willing and has more resources to um, focus research efforts on on things. I like patents, um, but they can be taken to extremes, and they're, they're you know they're sometimes you know the the laws yeah well actually I, i'm not going to uh, preach at you what i think this is your interview what do you think about the patent system um now you have a patent i got six, six. at least yes um and, and if someone's viewing this uh, a few years from now i'll probably have more hmm. i i've actually uh, my father and i have a little joke um uh, we're in a kind of patent race he's got i think 11 Right. Um, yeah, so I'm catching up to him, but he keeps getting more. Ah, wow. So, I mean, like, um, do you see that, so, well, well, it's been put forward that sometimes um, it's hard to progress when people are holding patents and are not willing to give them up except for extreme amounts of money that don't justify the patent. Well, don't justify are they the doing anything with the patents? Yeah, exactly. Also, keep in mind that patents by design have a limited lifespan, 20 years maximum. And I forget if that's actually less by now. Um, I but it was okay. More. <laughs> no, 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 20 years maximum. What? Yeah. Still now, a long time. What, <laughs> now, what These goes things. on yeah. is that you have people who um, try to file minor extensions of the patent to effectively get the patent. Um, renewed uh, over and over again to extend beyond the 20 years, that doesn't fly. Mm -hmm. um, what, what, could, or what could probably be used is a um, utility test where if you want to have this minor extension of the patent uh, by the same entity or a closely related entity, then um, do a test to see have you in fact employed the patent. 
Have you, in fact, been making use of the patent? Or are you just sitting on it? And if you're just sitting on it, then where did this little extension come from? Sure. Also, um, maybe be a little more um, strict on what exactly constitutes a patentable advance. Because a lot of the patents I see are these really, really tiny, minor things. Um, like you get, you do a thing, something with a right-hand twist instead of a left-hand twist. And that doesn't really change it, except that it does change the claim. And that's enough to get a new patent with a new 20-year extension. Mm. Well, it's useful to have patents if people are actually doing something with it and they can protect their investment, their intellectual investment, um, yeah. for sure. But there is a downside, and, and some people just buy patents and, and hoard them and don't do anything with them and trade them with other, will allow other companies to work on the, um, uh, mm -hmm. you know, something that requires a patent A, which Google has. You, you know, uh, Microsoft can go along and research as long as Google can exchange a favor with Microsoft um, so that Microsoft Patent X, Google can then use for some research, and they don't, you know, there might be some money exchanged, or maybe it's just a like um, an agreement between the two. I mean, smaller play players who would use these hoarded patents um, that m might may or may not be um, being used at all can't actually start, can't actually get their their feet off the ground. You know what I mean? And it gets a little worse actually if you are a small patent holder. Yeah. Um, the big patent guy, the big guys often have license or think they have license to ignore your patents. Right, right out. Right. You might as well not have your they'll patents. They'll compete you in court. Yeah, uh, they yeah. have the money to uh, sue you into the ground if you seriously attempt to invoke your patents, mm -hmm. and or at least they think they do. And so, if you do not have money for a lawyer, then what are you doing with the patents? Technically, that uh, is the status my patents are in. Mm. I know I've certainly tried to get a couple of them enforced and been ignored. Mm. Ah, okay. Right. Which mm. gets to another problem. If this really is what goes on, mm. then a lot of small inventors, a lot of the uh, innovation, is incented not to go to the patent route in the first place. Mm. They go to the trade secret and literally take their inventions with them to the grave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's nasty. I mean, Google got about 17,000 patents when it um, <laughs> acquired Motorola. Um, but it's also, it, Google also says patents are, are rubbish, you know, we don't need them, um, but they're, they're acquiring them. I think mm -hmm. philosophically some people in Google don't like the idea of patents, but um, when faced with the real world, they have to <laughs> um, grab them yeah. whenever they can, right? It's like, mm -hmm. a, it's like an arms race. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's an arms race, a defensive arms race for them. Also, keep in mind, Google is not one monolithic entity. No large corporation is. Even a single business unit of a large corporation is not one monolithic entity. So you got some people in Google who are saying, okay, yeah, we need to get patents, we need to stock off on patents, and they're going to do this. Mm. And then you got others who, they don't like patents, mm. like you said. A lot of interesting conflicting ideologies in, in businesses that it, uh, adds interesting dynamics like don't be evil. <laughs> hey, it, it's as good a mission statement as most I've seen. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's sufficiently vague that it allows for implementation, practical mm. implementation for all the various business units and at the same time sends a clear moral message and again, sometimes that's all you can say. Mm. They are, look, look, you know, uh, hats off to them for, for having that in the mission statement, but they are uh, accused of being hypocrites. This is true. Mm. On the other hand, um, who defines evil? Mm. I guess, well, if it's such a fluid notion, then <laughs> don't be evil becomes meaningless. Um, not entirely. <laughs> there are some things that a lot of people will define as evil. Mm -hmm. Right. So, keeps them out of that, at least. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, it also makes a clear statement that no, their primary objective is not shareholder value; mm -hmm. it is moral value. Mm -hmm. Even if that means their stock takes a beating sometimes. Yeah. And that's a lot more than a lot of corporations will say. Yeah, pulling out of China was a pretty gutsy move. Yeah. <laughs> was it wise? I mean, like, do you think the the actual ends will justify that that um, character? that Google upholded that virtue. 
uh, notice what the world, especially China, has done in response to Google's pulling out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that that particular one, Google won that round, even mm -hmm. if they had to pull out. Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, of course, also note that that has uh, not fully uh, played out yet. Right. <laughs> yeah, when can we say it has? <laughs> and how would we um, know when it has? Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if the regime change comes into play before it ends. In China. That that that's how powerful the players we're talking about are. Yeah. Do you think China's China will become more of a westernized democracy, or do you think it'll um, go more around the uh, sort of the current um, Mao Maoistic sort of um, um, communist society? Over time, I think it will eventually become a more westernized. Um, not as fast as a lot of people would like. Not nearly as fast. Hmm. On either hand, uh, say the same way that it has wherever. Right. Nah, not 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 even China. Hmm. Going back to the singularity, because I just I did have a like more more specific sort of point to talk about, and that is, if the singularity does does um, you know invalidate the need need for us to uh, provide utility to maintain the system, would you then prefer uh, a social <laughs> system? A social system? Yeah, like a, a so socialization of, of, of the utility. That, uh, oh, socialist system. Um, I believe it is very likely that we'll have one. Hmm. Okay. Um, whether I would prefer it or not, I think um, once you have a lot more, uh, lot more wealth and resources not doing much, and a lot more people who are not doing much, Inevitably, um, they're going to attract more of their, those resources. Okay. Would you vote for an AI government? Um, under the right circumstances, yes. Not just any AI government, of course. <laughs> yes, I know. It was a loaded question. Well, how would you how would how would you describe the uh, the ideal AI government? Um, the ideal as the ideal government, which just happens to be comprised of AIs. Sure. <laughs> now, define the ideal government. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's a difficult one, but I, I, I imagine one which is some sort of uh, benign, benevolent, compassionate steward, right? Mm -hmm. That that has yeah. more that that, that that can contribute more to the direction of society than the sum of um, meat bags in it or whatever. <laughs> and guess what? Every um, would-be dictator gets. Uh, el that promises to be hmm. a benign uh, caretaker hmm. that knows how to do these things better than any of the mere mortal humans that he's governing over. Isn't that interesting? But one thing they all have in common is ancestry in the ancestor in the savannah. They have a uh, well, adaptation executors of things that we evolved in our ancestral environment and. Neither, no one is an exclu uh, is is um is a ex well, AIs may um have uh, maybe uh, reinforced by different things may not have that sort of uh, the same sort of greed that we do. I don't know um, whether AIs will end up that way. I don't know if it's possible for an AI to be completely um, altruistic. Uh, towards like species, especially ones um, that are of low intellect in its own. I don't know. What do you think? Um, it is theoretically possible for a um, altruistic AI to be created, a one with no concept of greed. Theoretically. Um, theoretically. Hmm. Uh, whether it's actually ever going to happen, hmm. that's up. To, that's up to the guys who are going to make AIs. Hmm. Well, talk about like AI then. Like, uh, what do you think of Miri's efforts, or the the Singularity Institute used to be, um, in creating a mathematical theory of friendliness? Um, not as productive, not nearly as productive as the corporate efforts to actually implement useful tools and actually realistically capture um, um, aspects of consciousness uh, for uh, the public use. Mm -hmm. Um, like a, a IBM's Watson efforts. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So I mean, like, so you still think that they have use and function? It's um, but often people sort of put that the the actual utility of their function on par with IBM, for instance. And you disagree with that? Um, I think it is fair to say that the utility of IBM as a whole hmm. exceeds the utility of any one person within IBM, at least. Of course. And uh, for it should be pretty evident that the net net productive value of IBM, the corporate entity, exceeds the net productive value of any single member of it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the same pretty much applies to most of the AI individual AI researchers. Hmm. Um, now, partly that's not a fair statement, just because IBM is such a huge corporation. So that's like saying a hundred thousand is going to be greater than one. Well, yes, even a hundred thousand times one hundred one one hundred is still going to be greater than one. Mm. Um, that said, it's not that IBM's Watson is a part of IBM. It is that it is a AI effort that is being tested in the real world is getting real-world data and validation and is using that to speed back to create a better product. I believe that the AI, that, that part of AI is at the stage where that is the approach that is going to achieve the most benefit the fastest rather than doing this pure theoretical stuff at this time. Mm -hmm. Now, there's certainly room for some pure theory, yeah, but at this point, applications are what we need. Right. So you think pure theory actually will come out with a, uh, um, a proof for friendliness that is tractable, uh, uh, you know, over many iterations of um, change? Like a, I believe it will not come up with a proof of friendliness so long as it, as the researchers continue to uh, operate in a completely abstract environment. I believe that is a, a doomed effort and a waste of time. Um. One of my friends, Kevin Korb, is doing something interesting. He's, um, he's, he's well, as, in as much time as he has to do it amongst all the other little things he's doing. Little things, I should say, massive things. But anyway, he's a Bayesian. Um, but he, what he wants to do is test the, um, philosophical theories of method uh, using computational code, but using AI to do it. And I mean, it's, done, it's been done before. But it's it's kind of game theory, except it's game theory for philosophies. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, yeah, what what do you think about that sort of approach? Um, uh, it is potentially viable. I would have to read up on it before mm -hmm. I could comment further on it. Yeah. I mean, you you just you just described it to me. I do not have a deep opinion of it because I just heard of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, I'll send you some links. Um, Please do, other... yeah. I'd be interested in reading it. Mm. All right, I'll, I'll put that in my list to do. Uh, yeah, but anyway, okay, so now we've uh, discussed politics, we've discussed AI, extropianism, movement, transhumanism, we've discussed uh, Adrian's um, background. We have two more sections, one on nanotechnology and another one on the Casimir effect. Casimir effect. Casimir effect. Now, um, yeah, so they're both going to be online very soon, so please watch. Um, is there any concluding remarks you'd like to make about uh, the, the extropian movement, transhumanism, political ideologies, and that sort of thing? Um, it is a relief to see them become mainstream. Yes. And frankly, at this point, I wouldn't mind seeing a mainstream extropian a political party. Hmm. Okay. Just to take it further and go all the way to the public consciousness. So would you be and in favor? Was, would you be in favor of these Republicans and Democrats? <laughs> I mean, anyone in the U.S. who studied the system knows that both of the major political parties are not exactly in favor of the people. And yeah, just saying that means I'm not going. I'm probably not going to be able to run for office for, as a candidate for either of them. Hmm. If we are to have a third party, make a third party based on realization of all these new technologies, realization of these ways to benefit all of humanity. Are you in favor of like the formal, um, a, a more formal uh, rebirth of the extropian, um, not, not, it's, it seems more like just a community think tank at the moment, 
but a more like a formal system, kind of like Humanity Plus, except extropian. Uh, you know, the extropian. It, it would strongly depend on which, uh, or what method, or what form it takes. Yeah. I mean, a formal rebirth, maybe. Um, but as what? An institute that does what? Exactly. Right. What would you like to see? You mentioned um, um, politics, having a third party. Is there anything it, else? It being, a, it being a viable third party itself would be a, quite an achievement. Maybe uh, taking over one of the larger third parties, uh, but going first state by state, don't bother running any presidential candidates <laughs> for at least a decade. Yeah. Easy. Yeah. yeah. Uh, don't, don't run any presidential candidates until you have at least a quarter of the Senate or House. Hmm. Because wow. otherwise, you're going to put all your effort into that. You're not going to win, and you're not going to get uh, any uh, congressional guys. And perhaps don't even run that many congressional guys until you get up into the states, mm -hmm. the state legislature, maybe a few governors, and in those cases, you got enough thought that you can effectively run uh, the uh, local districts. If so, if you were to take over a political party at the moment, which one would you like to? Uh, the Greens and Libertarians seem the most attractive and most, um, A, in terms of how much reach they already have, and B, in terms of compatibility of philosophy. Okay. The Greens, um, did you say? Yep. Huh? The Greens? Yeah. yeah, okay. The Greens and the Libertarians. Yep. Okay. Good. Um, or possibly do some kind of merger of the two, although neither of them would, affect, would really like that. Yeah, maybe. Um... Interesting, you brought up that. Do, were you like uh, watching the Viridian Green movement? Um, I, from the edges, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What did you think of that? I mean, that was very uh, that was a techno progressive or very uh, progressive um, views on environmentalism. Like, yeah. Yeah, uh, it has the potential. It's uh, kind of sad to see that it didn't um, go much further than it did. On the other hand, it was an ideology, and it uh, didn't find ways to actually catch on. Remember I said earlier about the thing about the commercializing these new technologies? Mm. Uh, that applies to these ideologies, too. Mm. Uh, find ways to put them into practice. Now, the extropian movement, um, its initial ideals have become mainstream only partly because of uh, the extropian party's own uh, direct pushing, but also because they just become practical for a way to deal with with all the new things coming on. Yeah. Oh, look, it's 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 interesting how the mainstream have cottoned on to this, the, the transhuman ideas. Like, have you seen that new show? Like, um, Almost Human? Mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's not bad. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not it's not too bad, right? <laughs> it's, it's very mm -hmm. transhuman, right? <laughs> um, I recently watched Her. Have you seen Her? It's about an AI, right? I haven't seen that one yet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so these, the, these, um, at least the possibilities of these technologies with hints of ideology is coming into uh, more mainstream media, uh, and it's coming in slowly, and it's coming in in such a way that people will be sort of subjected to these ideas um, in a pill that they may be able to swallow that's uh, easier, will go down easier than like a textbook on nanotechnology or or you know some some person um, discussing the benefits of extropianism at a cocktail party to someone who's never heard of it before, right? <laughs> right. Well, and that's the thing is you don't describe the benefits of extropianism. Hmm. You describe what the ideals are, and you don't even bother putting a name brand on them. Yeah. You just say, I believe in this. I believe in that. I believe in that. And the people adopt these individual tenets, and you know what? Before long. He become an extropian before without even knowing what the term means, <laughs> without even having heard the term. Mm. Excellent. All right. Well, um, let's move on to the next section. It's going to be on nanotechnology. So stay tuned, viewers. We'll be back in just a jiff.